Hey everyone, you're joining me, Scott Helm. I'm here at GoTo Copenhagen, and you are joining me on this episode of GoTo Unscripted with Andy Greenberg. Do you want to give a quick intro? Sure. I'm a senior writer for Wired magazine, and I write about hackers and cybersecurity and surveillance. And uh, I guess most recently, I'm the author of this book, Tracers in the Dark, that's about, well, the subtitle is The Global Hunt for the Crime Lords of Cryptocurrency, and it's about the ways that people once believed that cryptocurrency was untraceable, the kind of perfect internet crime coin you know, some people thought, including me when I first wrote about it in 2011, I have to admit. And then how over the decade that followed, uh, I don't know, we kind of were all, or at least I and many cyber criminals, some, many criminals of all kinds, were quite surprised that it turned out to be the opposite, extremely traceable, and how this one small group of detectives used that to use cryptocurrency tracing to take down one massive cyber criminal operation after another over half a decade or so. Yeah, but please tell me about you, Scott, and what you work on as well. Yeah, so I'm mostly independent. I work in the, the, the cybersecurity space, typically on kind of like application website security. Um, all of the little projects that I started have kind of like grown into companies, including the, the one that I'm branded with, and they're, they're all focused around how to help people improve their cybersecurity on their website. So to avoid, you know, nowadays data breaches is the really, really common thing. Um, but we've also seen like digital skimming attacks where attackers will find ways to steal card data out of the page or going back, a, you know, even a few years prior to that. And hopefully we can touch on this later. Um, you can mine cryptocurrencies on a website. So when you visit a website, your machine is enslaved into mining cryptocurrencies. And uh, we refer to that as crypto jacking. And yeah, this, you know, going back into kind of 2014 through to 2018, that was quite a popular trend. So I'm, I'm yeah. interested to well, ask you actually about the anonymousness of um, of these cryptocurrencies. Because I think if I was to you know speak to people, certainly over the years, everyone kind of does think that cryptocurrency is anonymous, right? Like it's, well, it's almost like a default belief, isn't it? It's interesting for you. I was I thought you might say the opposite because so many people in our world think like. Andy, how could you be so dumb as to ever have thought that Bitcoin was anonymous? Within the tech bubble. Right, like, exactly. Within sure, this yeah. like, bubble that we live in. Yeah. Um, you know, like Bitcoin was initially, even Satoshi Nakamoto wrote in this initial email to a cryptography mailing list that participants can be anonymous. And a lot of people took that very can seriously. Be. Can be, exactly. <laughs> it turns out the only person who's actually managed that is Satoshi, pretty <laughs> yeah. much. He's the and, original person. Yeah, because everybody else like eventually cashes out their coins or, you know, uses them. And they don't leave a you know a billion bitcoins, a billion dollars anyway, un, untouched as he or she or they have. Um, yeah, so it has turned out that right. I mean, the, the larger I think community of even like uh, people seeking privacy with cryptocurrency, there was a whole kind of cypherpunk movement that thought this was the kind of holy grail of secret money for the internet. And I think they were all quite surprised when in around 2013 or so, the first big paper came out that showed, no, you can actually start to find patterns in this blockchain thing that is, in fact, a record of every single Bitcoin transaction. You know? So now we look back like a, a decade later and it seems almost ridiculous. Ridiculous. Like, how could you even think that this cryptocurrency underpinned by a blockchain that lists every transaction could have any anonymity properties? But, you know, they are just transactions between addresses these pseudonyms, basically. So if it's not anonymous, it's at least pseudonymous. It just turns out that is easier than we thought to find uh, kind of threads through those pseudonyms and clusters of lots of different addresses that belong to single pseudonyms. And then to often, you know, kind of pierce the veil between someone's pseudonyms, their addresses, and their real identity. And that turned out to be incredibly powerful for law enforcement. You know, the, <laughs> the story of my book is really about how these detectives use this as a kind of, you know, incredibly powerful tool to take down dark web drug markets, to trace stolen coins like the Mt. Gox heist was. Yeah, that was, that was a big one. That was cracked with cryptocurrency tracing. Uh, and it was, you know, 650,000 Bitcoins, which almost is like a mind boggling sum today. What was that worth back then? I was going to say, because that's, that's yeah. quite a different sum yeah. from then till now, right? Well, it's, yeah, it was half a billion dollars. And um, back then, uh, at the time it was discovered, anyway, it turns out it had been stolen years earlier and sold for like pennies on the dollar. Of course, but then, yeah, it's still those people who thought that they had money in Mt. Gox, they lost half a billion dollars that they believed that they had in 2014. Uh, and it's funny to kind of see history repeating itself with FTX today, which not only has gone bankrupt, but has had has lost 
half a billion dollars to hackers. I'm not sure people have like paid attention to this story within the meltdown of FTX, but thieves actually stole on the day of their bankruptcy another half billion dollars of their money. So yeah, um, but, but you have also like, it's interesting that I, one thing that I really don't cover at all in the book is crypto jacking. And it sounds like yeah. you have done a major kind of investigation on this. Uh, please, yeah, tell the story. It's a really kind of bizarre story in that I, I didn't set out um, to be involved in it and it all kind of came around by accident, but I, I, I'll give like the, the brief backstory and then I actually have a few questions that I want to ask you now about this story based on what you've just said already. So uh, my focus, as I mentioned earlier, is, is kind of on securing websites and, and you know how organizations can protect essentially their customer's data because most websites is people putting their data in and, and if there's some kind of breach, it's always like my data. So we've seen loads of attacks over the years where attackers will want to steal my username and password or you know all of my identity information to then apply for loans or credit cards in my name and do your traditional identity theft. And then it became really popular kind of in the 2014 era, this thing called crypto jacking. And what the attackers realized was it's like, well, hey, look, if we can get our, our malicious code into somebody's website, and normally customers would go there and will steal their username and password or their name and address. They were like, well, we're running code in the customer's browser. And like, if we're running code, we can mine cryptocurrency because that's, that's all that's required, right? Nice, like nice. you just have a crypto miner. And one of the most popular ones back then was from an organization called CoinHive. And they had a like they had a, a legitimate pitch for their product, which was you go to a website and they subject you to adverts because they need to make revenue and adverts are sometimes impact performance and they impact privacy. So what you could do is you could load the CoinHive mining library. And when visitors come to your website, you would borrow some of their device power to mine a little bit of cryptocurrency as a substitute for advertisements. So that was their the, the kind of uh, legitimate you know, pitch, if you will. And unfortunately, that's not often what happened because what people realized was if I can set up you know, CoinHive, but then install it on your website, right, right. maliciously, all of your visitors will mine the cryptocurrency, but then they'll send it to me instead of you. And this is what became known as crypto jacking, this hijacking people's devices to try and mine currency and steal it. And did CoinHive take a commission on this? What was their business model? So. I actually don't know the. I never used CoinHive officially, and I, I was kind of a little bit against it from the outset. It it's felt, a bit of a sketchy. Yeah, idea. yeah. I, I struggled with the my own comfort with the idea, and I'm sure that there's probably a way that you could have conveyed that and done it appropriately. But I, I think I, most people, when they visit I'm a website, sure. don't expect their like GPU yeah. to start. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly up, this. Like, yeah. So, so I always kind of struggled with that component of it. And, and CoinHive specifically is one of the players were, were also a bit of a flash in the pan because I think they, they shot to fame too fast, hmm. became used for crypto jacking very, very quickly. Of course. And, and then, yeah. you know, like that, that brought all the wrong kind of attention in, right. in really large quantities. Um, but these, you know, organizations, groups, I mean, heck, maybe they were individuals that, that did this realized, you know, if we can get the mining library onto somebody's website, onto a big enough website, you know, then they have lots of traffic. We make lots of, and it was Monero that they were mining. Uh, we make lots of money. So <laughs> they realize, you know, if we breach and attack an individual site, we get all of that site's visitors. If we breach this individual site, we get all of the visitors to that site. But then I guess they also realized if, if we breach a dependency and that dependency is used by hundreds of sites or thousands of sites, then we breach the one dependency and then a thousand websites load it, we've now breached a thousand sites and we've got the visitors. And this particular one was a text-to-speech plugin. So it's a little JavaScript like widget that you put on your page and if you have a visually impaired visitor, it will read components of the page. And they compromised this company's servers, injected their malicious code into the dependency. And unfortunately, because it was text-to-speech and it was obviously very much around accessibility, government websites have very high accessibility requirements. So we found over 5,000 government sites that were loading this uh, text-to-speech. So this is a kind of like supply chain crypto jacking case. Exactly that. Much. It's yeah. Your, yeah, so you're, it's like the two things together. You got like a super traditional supply chain attack. Yeah. And then the fact that they were going after cryptocurrency. But it's sort of like a supply chain web attack too, which is like such an yeah. interesting, I don't know. Uh, it's like a just a wonderful, like terrible series of events. And this is the thing, right? Yeah. It's a wonderful, terrible series of events. I like that. Well, it's really, you know, uh, my thought about crypto jacking, yeah, I mean, it's like, well, I guess the scary thing is they had access to thousands of websites. Like, what could yeah. they have done if not, if they weren't just interested in well, mining something the narrow, thing, right? You know, like it's, 
and, and this got loads of media attention, especially in the UK, because I, I was actually notified about this issue from a friend of mine. He's like, you know, I've gone to this website and it's running really, really slow. And, and then like later on my antivirus popped up this thing. And, and he's like, could you take a look? And that's actually how I started the investigation process, totally by accident on a Sunday morning. And eventually, of course, you know, the following days we realized the scale of the attack and then different governments start getting involved in the remediation. And inevitably, you know, I spoke to the press and, and we did a really big story with the BBC. And one of the questions the journalist at the time said was, you know, like, okay, so they've, they've mined this Monero, we're still trying to figure out how much, and maybe you can help me with that in, in a moment, but they were like, what could they have done? And, and at this point, it's like, well, I don't know, like, if you can think of it, then we can do it. Like, once you have the ability to just inject arbitrary code yeah. into the page, I was like, you think of it and, and I will do it. Well, the, the one that, that, I don't know, maybe the most disruptive thing would have been ransomware, right? I mean, uh, yeah. I, I almost like, I, I look at, that's the thing, like, a, um, crypto mining is definitely a nasty business. I mean, crypto jacking, rather. Yeah. Um, mining, I don't, you know, I won't talk about the environmental <laughs> effects or whatever, <laughs> yeah. but, but, uh, but I do sometimes think like, well, that was a nice, like, peaceful era before uh, it became more profitable just to hold these sites hostage instead, yep. right? Like, it's... If you if I'm going to choose between like having everybody who visits my site spin up their GPUs and you know and like get annoyed, give me four cents in Monero, <laughs> right? Um, versus taking my own website and server hostage and demanding I don't know whatever it is. Well, the even of thousands biggest of dollars. scale thing here would be the visitors to those sites, you know, because it, right. you know we we only managed to find around five thousand government sites. Uh, that were impacted by this. But then I guess like the, the even larger scale thing was like, what if they then turned that around and targeted the visitors to those sites? Because how many people go to a, right, yeah. you know, government sites on a day-to-day -day basis? It's, well, it's a kind of it like must be a beautiful lot. attack to find this one plugin. Is that what it is? A plugin yeah, that, yeah. It, that then gives you five, it gives you thousands of sites, which gives you millions of And it has to be millions, visitors, right? Like it's, right? It's, yeah. it's got to be yeah. for, you know, for like, and, and I have in the, the blog post and in the talk that I'm giving tomorrow, I actually cover the investigation into this. You know, I've got samples of all of the largest government sites from different countries. And it's like, you know, the UK, the US, Australia, New Zealand, you know, like really populous countries. So then they must have had lots of visitors to their, you know, to their website. So we're, we're very lucky that really all they chose to do was mine some cryptocurrency, I guess, because it's a very short-lived attack. It doesn't have any lasting impact. You know, you go to the website five minutes, your you know your computer's busy for five minutes. Right. But then when you leave, really all trace is gone. Whereas if they decided to download some malware onto my device or try and right, you course, know try yeah. and ransomware my device and then just charge me like you know even ten dollars multiplied by the millions of people that that would have impacted, that would have been really significant. Yeah, but I suppose they you know it's it is stealthy as well. Like when when ransomware groups have done, you know, large scale worms or wanna cry or something, mm. then they make way too much noise. They, you know, it often doesn't even serve them that well. They end up with like FBI wanted posters with their names on it. Yeah. I wonder if that's kind of what happened to some of the people involved in like crypto jacking, because it was such a flash in the pan. Mm -hmm. I always wonder, you know, they they kind of achieved the notoriety but then didn't have, you know, the, the plateau of success for a period of time. It, it seemed to literally be like flashing the pan and then gone. Yeah. Well, I do think, I think it's, it seems like some of them maybe moved on to ransomware, which is a more probably a more profitable, much more malicious in a way sort of business. I do, I, I've also, you know, I am sometimes working on like um, stories about more of like the low level teen hacker community. and. I have recently heard a story about one guy who made enormous amounts of money through crypto jacking and was never identified, never charged. I think he was probably even a minor at the time. So like a nutty minor with an O, like he was yeah. under the age of yeah, 18. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I think that some people probably just got away with it too, because it is a relatively subtle, you know, profit model compared to ransomware or something like that. And this is all all of these attacks go back to, isn't it? Ultimately, like they're here to make money. Whoever these right. these people are, like they, I've not really seen any scenarios where there is an alternative objective other than how do we make some money? You know, so it's like, well, what can we do? And and I guess the idea with the crypto jacking thing was, you know, this was actually found, like we believe based on, obviously it's, it's very difficult to look back after the fact, but we believe based on all of the evidence that it wasn't actually there for that long. But I guess, as you say, with it being like so subtle and, and you know, essentially kind of undetectable to most normal people, 
you know, if they were there for days or weeks or months, I presume was probably their objective. You know, if you're getting millions of people to mine you a few cents here and there in Monero every day, right? then, you know, but that, that starts to sound attractive. You weren't able to like uh, put, pull together like an estimate of, of their profits. I guess the Monero, Monero is designed to prevent that, right? Yeah, so this is one of the things that I did want to loop back to you on actually. So cryptocurrency is an, uh, you know, I understand the basic operation and that's as far as my knowledge goes. And, and so obviously within the miner, we could see the address and throughout the, the duration of the entire attack where the money was being sent was, was consistent. So any of those, um, you know, what do you call it, a transaction when you mine it and then send it to the Monero wallet, they would have all gone to like this one uh, consistent address. But my, that's not my area of expertise. So I never try to look into yeah. Where, where did yeah. the money go? Or even if you could look, where did the money go? Well, certainly if it had been Bitcoin, you could very easily, and if it was all going to one address, you could just see how much money had accumulated at that address. It's all sitting right there on the blockchain, you know. But I think, of course, like the whole idea of them using Monero probably was to prevent that because Monero tangles up its blockchain in all kinds of uh, clever ways. It, I think obscures the amounts of transactions. Uh, it so creates as... like... Uh, kind of transparent. It includes a kind of mixed network. I don't even know all of the features of Monero today. I, it's it's it combines. It has kept adding them. In fact, over time, and I'm not sure where things stood in 2017. At one point, Monero was more traceable than it is now. In fact, some like serious vulnerabilities were found in it, but they were fixed. They might have even been fixed by the time of this, you know, campaign. Um, but it's still super interesting to me to kind of like try to figure out. How, I mean, because I've written a whole book about cryptocurrency tracers, I, you know, I have seen a leaked chain analysis, chain analysis being like, you know, um, the $9 billion crypto tracing startup. Uh, I've seen a leaked document that they presented to the Italian police, it was in Italian, that in which they claimed that they can trace Monero and in 65% of cases, they can get a usable lead. And then another 15, they can find the sender, but not the recipient. But, you know, it's, Nobody knows how they do that. It is almost certainly like probabilistic rather than, yeah, you know, deterministic. With Bitcoin, you can easily just you know cr find out whose addresses they are, finds you know a uh, cluster, and then just start you know adding up the values of the ad the coins of those addresses. I think with Monero, it's far harder, but it does seem like there have been breakthroughs in Monero tracing in recent years, although. Monero people really do not like me talking about that and <laughs> get quite mad when I point this out. But in the there was a in 2022 this ca case came to light. That was this 4.5 billion dollar theft from the Bitfinex exchange, which you might remember. Um, yeah, I remember the headlines. <laughs> yeah, this this actually came this the story broke like just as I was finishing the book. I kind of just mentioned it in the epilogue, but it's a crazy story in part because like the. The woman in this money laundering couple in New York, they're not just money launderers, they've now pled guilty to the theft itself too, but they were charged initially with money laundering. But the woman in this, you know, husband wife couple had posted these like incredibly embarrassing rap videos to YouTube. Do you remember this? Oh um, no. Okay, yeah. Anyway, yeah. She was she called herself the crocodile of Wall Street. You gotta you should maybe uh. not check these out. I don't know. They're, but <laughs> Um, but they, at one point, they did some like clever things to try to cover their tracks, including they took a big tranche of the money and exchanged it for Monero. You can see this in the IRS criminal investigations document that was published with their with their indictments. And uh, and yet you can see that like after it's exchanged for Monero, the IRS just continues to draw the chart like if the money goes here and here. Like uh, so, it that seems to be kind of a giveaway that IRS can somehow trace Monero. Uh, in fact, you know, we know that they have a relationship with chain analysis, that they use chain analysis. They have in like some of the biggest cases in simply like the history of cybercrime. They they use chain analysis to bust, for instance, the first, second, and third biggest to make the biggest seizures of not just cryptocurrency, but of money of any kind in law enforcement history in those years. So it seems very likely that IRS has access to this chain analysis secret Monero tracing capability. Um, so yeah, it's but it, but it's it's still kind of frustrating that for people like you and me, we can't access that or figure out yeah. see anything in the Monero blockchain. It's only the kind of uh, people who can afford those five figure chain analysis licenses, I guess, who can do that. And is it down to like what we call the opsec, the operational security of the person using the currency in terms of like how anonymous you are? Like yeah. I, I assume well, there's things that you can do to improve your anonymity. I'm sure that you could like layer something else on top of Monero um, so that when you cash it out and at an exchange, even if the exchange 
has your know your customer identity, you know, exchanges have to collect identifying information on their users. So the idea is that you use a, a coin or a laundry system so that like once you cash it out, you're not connected to whatever criminal thing you did with the money because your identity is at the exchange. But I imagine the people who use Monero think that it's safe to just cash it out directly at an exchange because it is itself a kind of money, you know, it is, I don't want to say it's a money laundering system, but it is a coin that like um, is designed to mix up everybody's coins together and make them harder to trace so that you could safely cash out your coins without, you know, um, any sort of connection to a criminal event. Uh, it just seems like there is some, nonetheless, some way to trace those coins. And and that is kind of like the whole story of cryptocurrency to me is it's it's like sets this trap. People once believed that Bitcoin was anonymous and and therefore it kind of like seduced all of these people seeking privacy and, and cyber criminals of all kinds for a decade, pulling in like uh, all sorts of nasty businesses from drug dealing to child sexual abuse materials networks. And then all of it actually was exposed by the fact that the blockchain actually records every single transaction yeah. and is quite transparent. So it seems like in some ways the same thing may be happening. I, I don't know, um, to some degree with Monero too. Uh, we'll just have to see what cases come out of it. I remember seeing in fact, like when I wrote about the, the use of Monero in that Bitfinex theft case and the fact that it seemed to me that IRS had traced it, some Monero people you know, on Twitter got very mad at me. And then others responded, well, we'll just see who gets arrested. And that's how we'll find out like how true this is. So I don't know, I w personally, I would not be using, I would not want to use a, a privacy tool where the way I find out if it works or not is if I'm arrested. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> that, that seems like that's where Monero's, you know, kind of capabilities are at today. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if, um, because I'm, I'm sure I'll have the address somewhere in my notes and I, to my recollection, I, I don't think I published it. But it would be really interesting to see if there's any way to look back at that even now. I, you know, I assume right. nothing would change over time. We either can or cannot. Right. I mean, blockchains are forever. That's like part of the problem with using them for crime is that when somebody develops a new capability years later, they can go back in time and excavate evidence from that blockchain. Yeah. And the criminal cannot go back and erase it. It's gone, you know, it's out there forever. So that's true of Monero too, I, I'm pretty sure. So, um, it will be interesting. Maybe like I can, you know, put you in touch with some chain analysis people who might be willing to do this. That would be interesting because yeah. we've never, from from the original breach, obviously through to the you know the remediation steps and then the long term solutions that were implemented as well. I've never seen anything come back to the headlines. I've never heard of any, even kind of you know criminal investigation that might have looked at who was responsible for this. And, really, and wow. there was this yeah. like one Monero address sat there on the page throughout this whole breach, and and it was on all of the government sites. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, um, it would be fascinating to just know how much they made with this, but then also to identify who who was behind it would be, you know, kind of a horrible coup. Yeah. I'm curious about because we, there was, we had a lot of um, discussions around that at the time, you know, and given, you know, the nature of the attack and how the attack was done. And then also once they had this capability to do anything that they wanted and they chose to mine Monero, it was either you know, the, the kind of the two guesses were somebody quite sophisticated that just wanted to remain undetected for a long time, or, you know, perhaps even like a, a minor, like you said earlier, someone that just stumbled, you know, across mm -hmm. this and thought, oh, this would be cool. You know, it felt, it was really hard to pin exactly which angle that it was coming from. Yeah. But if it had been someone truly with like malicious intentions, there's a thousand other things that they would have done. Yeah, although the, the use of the plugin to get so many sites, that does seem, like somewhat pro to me. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The For all of these ransomware cases too, cryptocurrency tracing usually is capable of identifying who, you know, who pulled off these, you know, terrible crimes to with kind of amazing exactitude. Like you can see, Chainalysis anyway, seems able to see every layer of these organizations based on their cryptocurrency transactions. But the problem is they're in Russia. And like, <laughs> what do you do with that information? You can help to, I don't know, indict these guys in absentia or uh, sanction them in some cases, but if they're kind of beyond the political border, then it doesn't really matter if you can identify them. It would still be fascinating. And yeah. and um, I'm, I kind of imagine that your person in this coin hive thing is, as well is most likely not in a Western country or an extradition country, but nonetheless, it'd be 
really interested to see who did it. If if you could do that tracing to pull it off. I'll dig out the address because it will be yeah. in all of the, because we were like throughout the event, we were recording the payloads to see if there was any involvement in the attack. Um, and then the question just, will be like, will would chain analysis or somebody else want to show that they have a Monero tracing capability? You know, there, there, there might have to be some parallel construction involved for anybody to actually give us an yeah, answer. Anything useful on that. Yeah. But it would be fascinating. And you know the the kind of the weird thing as well. Obviously, CoinHive fell off the map a little bit because you know obviously speculation from the outside, but you know maybe they were a bit of a flash in the pan because they brought a lot of attention and and this whole kind of crypto jacking thing, I guess, was ultimately really damaging for their proposed brand and, and product. And and we did see like other minor variants of that, but now the attackers have just moved on to things that are even more profitable. I assume they weren't making huge amounts of money mining Monero in a browser. You know it was. It can't have been enormous amounts. I bet the play was long term, you know, a few cents multiplied by a million a day. Or something. Right, right. I just wonder so, if like the, the curve of like processing power necessary to mine any significant amount of cryptocurrency has moved to the point where crypto jacking doesn't work anymore. Is that the deal? Is that there's also that I think that might have been one of the big reasons for Monero as well, because it's right. much more friendly to oh, be yeah. mined in that environment, which is CPU based mining. And back then you couldn't do GPU based mining oh, in a browser see. like that. So I think that was possibly again speculation, but I think that was possibly one of the reasons they went for Monero mm -hmm. because it was more friendly to the circumstances that they found themselves in. So yeah, I think nowadays you're probably absolutely right. It would be irrelevant, <laughs> you know, the amount of money that you could actually yield with that. It right. just wouldn't be worth the risk. Which may be part of why we've seen all these criminals switch to ransomware instead, which is sadly like a much more disruptive thing for society and schools and hospitals and yeah. governments. Yeah. It has been fascinating to watch it evolve. You know, there's this criminal empire, how <laughs> we want to refer to it, whatever. Uh, these people, or do we call them organizations? People, you know, it's. Oh, I think that they're definitely organizations. I mean, um, they're they have org charts and bosses and office hours. It seems like, uh, yeah, I um, I don't cover ransomware too closely. My colleagues at Wired do, and have broken some great stories based on the leaks of internal communications of groups like Conti and Trickbot, and and they complain about their like kind of working conditions and just like talk about what they're going to do on the weekend. It seems like just you know in an, ex an extremely like kind of organized and boring work life way. Yeah, they're really, um, I, th I think they're like practically corporations, you know. Well, you can jump on a, if you get ransomware now, you can just jump on and speak to support, can't That's you? Right. They'll help yeah. you, you know, they'll help you yeah. decrypt your, your files after you paid the ransom. I was quite surprised to see that. Um, I forget which group it was, but yeah, basically life support. You know, you, it's like, okay, you, you paid the ransom, you need some help decrypting all your stuff, you know, jump on with a support agent. <laughs> it's like, wow, this is, uh, yeah, this feels like you say more like a, a criminal empire than some group yeah. of, you know, some small group of people or something like that now. We're far beyond that, aren't we? Yeah, and there really just doesn't seem to kind of be an end in sight. I mean, it's it's been depressing for me having like written a book about this incredible power of cryptocurrency tracing to see that you know, it really cannot solve this problem. You know, I think that even chain analysis is very clear about that. You can use it to try to find the kind of off ramps to where these criminals are trying to to cash out, basically to liquidate their profits, and those exchanges are being sanctioned and shut down. But um, speaking of mining, there's like, we've even seen like some of some of these criminals now feeding their coins into services where you can rent mining rigs and then mine clean coins. They mine clean coins with the dirty coins as a means of laundering. And there's just, there always seems to be like one more laundering trick that's available in this kind of cat and mouse game that enables this ransomware epidemic to continue. And they must have the amount of you know, resources, money, essentially, at their disposal now. I remember a talk recently um, by a chap called Miko Hippinen. Of course, yeah. And I, I'm just, it literally just sprang into my mind then. And I'm sure that they were looking and saying, like, basically how, you know, how far away are we from, like, a billion-dollar criminal enterprise? And and he kind of did some analysis. analysis and, and he was like, well, actually, it, you know, if the attackers and the groups that pulled off these heists did nothing and then just held the currency for this many years, they already have a billion dollars just yeah. because of the phenomenal growth in the value of Bitcoin yeah, since yeah. some of these earlier attacks. And he's like, you know, so you think about that. We're not talking, you know, organizations, criminal organizations with millions of dollars or, or tens or hundreds of millions. He's like, you know, we could, 
we could have a, a criminal organization out there with a billion dollars at its disposal. Yeah, and well, it's, like, you know, I guess that that's, um, it's a crazy thought, but, but, but I, you know, as I said, like the IRS uh, pulled off these three cases, one of which was this was two people in New York City who had stolen, uh, I think it was 120,000 Bitcoins at the time that they stole them. By the time that the money was taken back by IRS, or about like 80% of it was, it was $4.5 billion. So that is a two person operation that was a separate criminal unicorn, you know, and several times over. I, you know, the, the second and third biggest cases that the IRS uh, pulled off, I mean, the second, second and third biggest seizures of money in law enforcement history, one, but actually both of them were hackers who had stolen money from the Silk Road, the dark web drug market. Early that was on. a big story when that got busted, right. I remember that. There were two, in fact, of uh, these hackers who, before the Silk Road was taken down, had found perhaps the same vulnerability in the site where you could, I think it was actually maybe as simple as like, <laughs> just like entering negative values. You could um, like increase your balance and pull um, that, you know, Bitcoins wow. out of the site, basically. And um, both so, of them, like, buy a negative quantity of an item, and I think so. essentially get um, a refund. Or maybe as a vendor, you, I, I don't remember what it, the actual vulnerability was. I'm not sure it's ever been fully made public. But uh, each of them amassed tens of thousands of bitcoins this way, and I think they were both smart enough to know that if they tried to cash out these giant sums, they were more likely to be identified. So both of them sat on these coins for years and years until each of them had billions of dollars worth of bitcoins at the exchange rate at the time in 2020 and 2021 when they were caught. I mean, IRS criminal investigations traced their coins, even though they didn't spend them. These poor guys, you know, they sat on these coins for years and years. <laughs> and you don't even make an interest on Bitcoin, are you? <laughs> one, exactly. One of them like had, you know, I think 70,000 coins in a popcorn tin under the floorboards of his closet, you know, um, wow. and he, that's billions of dollars. I think he did maybe cash out like just enough of it to kind of live large. Um, he didn't buy years. a green Lamborghini and get himself caught that way, did he? <laughs> uh, I think I did, there are photos of him, you know, in saunas or like hot tubs on yachts and things. But um, this poor guy, he then has his whole stash seized and he's now facing in prison as well for, for hacking the Silk Road itself, a criminal site. It's uh, just a bizarre story. But those guys, each of them were essentially like one man, billion dollar cyber criminal operations. I mean, the world of of crypto is just the numbers are so bizarre that, if, yeah, it doesn't surprise me at all that Miko did that map and found, I mean, I'm sure ransomware groups, some of them, if they held on to like a few tens of thousands of the Bitcoins that they were making early on are billion dollar operations. It's just so much money for it is. an organization like that to have at their disposal. It makes them yeah. unstoppable. It makes you know, them, they could bribe anyone. Anything, yeah, yeah anyone. Yeah. So do you uh, it think is very scary. The, because we, I've seen a lot of kind of um, speculation around the long-term prospects for cryptocurrency as a whole, obviously. And, and I used to play around with mining like back in the early, early days when it was actually viable to mine on a GPU. I've always been a gamer. I had to play around with my GPU. And, you know, back in the days when Bitcoins were five cents, you know, less than a dollar. And now, and I don't actually know the, like the present day value, but I, I saw a peak of like 34,000 US per Bitcoin. Was that? Oh, it was much bigger than that. The peak so it was higher? like 75. Now it's at 25 or so. I don't hold any Bitcoin. I'm not like interested in, not in like, investing, but I did, I don't know. I, I track it in part just so that I can like, I don't know, keep up with what, you know, this, do the math to talk about like the, so this many Bitcoins were seized, with this, which is worth this much. When I first wrote about Bitcoin uh, in 2011, it was worth a dollar and I, tried to buy about 40 bitcoins um for 40 dollars at the time and i put in this like transaction on mount gox the only exchange that existed back then and it didn't go through because like mount gox was so buggy and terrible and i just gave up and I, I like i try not to think too often about like how you know i guess well i'm doing it right now but it'd be like a million dollars <laughs> today right 40 bitcoins wow. um wait is that right 40 i oh, know we'll do the math later but it's a lot of money and uh i yeah i regret my lack of persistence in just doing that like simple transaction. I always see the the, the kind of the, the famous tale of buying a pizza for 10,000 Bitcoins. And right, I think, yeah. uh, but you were there, you're saying when you were mining them and they were worth cents. Yeah, so yeah, like, and I have like distinct memories of like five cents and eight cents a piece. And, and what did you do with those coins? So I like, I used to hold Bitcoin. Um, 
So, and and I hate talking about this, and I don't really talk about it. But I sold out when they hit a hundred dollars. Yeah, I would have done the same. You know, I'm sure. uh, it was like and you probably thought that you were brilliant. I mean, you were like you made a huge return on you your know, investment. Right? And then you look and think, uh, you know, you never look back, right? Never look back. Never, never like sit there and do the the kind of you know twenty twenty hindsight thing. But yeah, I was like, this is crazy. This is wild. You know, these these things that some of them you know were in getting up to like the single you know dollar value per coin, but. Yeah, I was pretty much out of everything at like $100 a Bitcoin. And then the, I've only dabbled and played since then. Uh, there was another coin that got released called Shiba. In it, oh, I really? think it was called. Yeah, and I was not just like, Dogecoin, but no, yeah, like Shiba some, related coin. Yeah, yeah. and I, you know, I was like, I'll buy like $100 and sell it three days later for like $400 or something. Really? Wow. <laughs> it was just like a bit yeah. of fun at that time because I was still kind of, Shiba Coin is actually worth like seventy-five thousand dollars today. Did you, know, did you know that? Wow! No, no I'm just joking. But, no, um, but, okay. But, uh, I yeah. was about to start crying. Um, <laughs> but is it here for the long term now? Like, have we got is cryptocurrency now? You know, has it got over its kind of crazy fluctuation period, and 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 we now have like a bit of a, you know, like a long term stability there. I have, you know, I've never like been terribly interested in like whether Bitcoin is going up or down. Although everybody's interests in my writing about it is like completely directly correlated to the price of Bitcoin sometimes, I, I noticed. But that's just because the criminals want the valuable thing, right? Like the well, yeah. I think that for them, they don't actually care terribly much whether the cryptocurrency is going up or down in value. They actually just probably want to cash it out pretty yeah. quickly. And for them, it is this, if not the untraceability, it's the uncensorability of cryptocurrency yeah. that it's very difficult to, in some cases, it is, you know, it is untraceability they're seeking. Um, whether or not that is makes any sense at all, um, very often it doesn't. You know, they they have this illusion of its untraceability still. But I think in many other cases, it's just like the same thing that makes Bitcoin helpful for like sending remittances. You can send money to Ukraine very yeah. easily with crypto. It makes it easy. Versus you know. the traditional banking system, it has to be much more flexible. Surely, to, right? Yeah. You know, to when the Ukraine war broke out, we saw like. I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars sent to Ukraine with crypto. And at the same time, donations were being like frozen and seized in people's PayPal accounts. So uh, it really did show its its purpose there uh, for, in some ways. But that, that is also why I think often why criminals like it too, because when the ransom is sent, it can't be recovered, you know, even if you can yeah. trace it to its destination. Um, so, but so, so I think that they don't, you know, for them, it's just like a, a means of transaction. It's one of the very few people who actually use crypto for that purpose. Yeah. Most other people, I think, are still buying it as like a store of value, right? Um, I was going to say, like, yeah, if we do analysis on, given like the, the public ledger nature of Bitcoin, you know, is there that transaction volume there that suggests day-to-day -day consumer use or, you know, like, is, it, is there a... I'm not sure. I, you know, crypto boosters definitely like to say that it's there, but... I mean, when was the last time you saw anybody spend crypto on anything? Well, so this was literally the thought that was going through my mind then, you know, it's, we were promised, you know, Bitcoin payment cards and exactly, Bitcoin ATMs yeah. and, and everything else. But I, and that didn't work out. Um, and neither, <laughs> you know, neither has the anonymous money thing, you know, um, it's not digital cash in either of those respects. It might be digital gold. And know? aren't the transaction fees now mega significant again i don't follow the kind of day-to-days but it seems like they are yeah it, it, seems it sounds like very expensive to people pay. talk about it as like you know perhaps it's a layer one and you do these like different kinds of transactions on top of that that are lower transaction fees but it but it doesn't certainly is not like what i remember like going into a cafe in berlin and like they you can buy bitcoin, a beer with bitcoin that's not happening as far as i can tell Anywhere. I do a good bit of travel. You know, we're sat here right now in like Copenhagen. I get yeah. around, certainly around Europe a lot. And I, I, I have to say, and, and usually in capital cities, which is probably the, the best chance of seeing a Bitcoin ATM or a, a bar that accepts Bitcoin for beer. And I, I can't say I've ever noticed it or seen it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. But, you know, you and I, it's, it's now at $25,000. Like, I think <sighs> most of the media would say that it's that's low, which is shocking probably to you and me. I've yeah. seen it at a dollar, you've seen it at eight cents or whatever. And to us, that's like, oh, you know, that's so many orders of magnitude larger than I ever thought it could be. That that's, you know, that as a reality check, it's like, wow, it's actually been incredibly successful. Um, but then everybody covering like the FTX trial or Sam Bankman-Fried's trial, which yeah. is just starting this week, they see us as being in a kind of like, you know, FTX inflicted crypto winter 
where Bitcoin lost two thirds of its value, but two thirds of seventy five thousand dollars. Whereas you know, the numbers I think to people who have been around like since you know you and I started looking at, at crypto, it's still you know just shocking. And if it doesn't feel like winter if you started eight cents and ended twenty five thousand dollars. Yeah, for sure. And I you know I think. I'm going to have to go and dig some photos and things out now because I've never really, you know, paid too much thought back to those days, and I like to try well, and forget about the also, fact that I sold I mean, it all. Are you sure that you didn't? Like, yeah, I would just be almost scared that I left it How many times I've been through my there. hard drives? Yeah, 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 I was just literally thinking the same thought pattern as you. Then it's like the amount of times when I've dug out like my old wallets, and I'm like, I'm just going to double check I didn't leave three bitcoins. Exactly. <laughs> you right. know, in some in some forsaken corner. But I remember back in the day as well when you could make like cool Bitcoin addresses with your name at the beginning. So like my Bitcoin address is like one Scott and then okay. all of the usual, because yeah. you could, there was like a little tool that would make a Bitcoin address for you with your name or some other string in it. Um, but yeah, that was a long, a long time ago. And I remember the, the rig I was mining on was super, you know, basic. It had a really like RTX 10 series card in it back in whatever they were called back then. So, you know, this was, God, it must have been like the late 2000s, I'm sure. Yeah, I have a feeling in my mind it was like pre-2010. 2009, I guess. Like, yeah. I mean, so maybe it? a little after. I don't know when yeah. the, because there was a period when it was just worth nothing for, you know, for a good time there before it even got into like the tens of cents of yeah, the dollar. Yeah. So it was, it was definitely early on and I should have stuck in it. Yeah. But I, I I've interviewed Hal Finney, who was the second ever user of Bitcoin after Satoshi, you know. Wow. And he was dying of uh, Luke Eric of ALS at the oh. time. He was fully paralyzed, could only respond to me with like eye movements, his eyebrows even. He could not even use his like eye movement based keyboard very easily at that time. Um, but I interviewed his family too. And I mean, the poor, the poor family, like they, um, they sold like most of their coins pretty early, but then they also, he, he was mining so early. I mean, ridiculously early, like before anyone, but almost like him and a few other people and Satoshi knew what Bitcoin was. And, you know, his wife was like, why is the computer making so much noise? Can we just turn this thing <laughs> off? You're just doing this as like an open source project. Just turn it off, you know, and just imagine, you know, the, the value, like the wealth that they generated and then like, you know, stopped generating. But I don't know, that's probably everyone's story in the early days of Bitcoin. You can't like, uh, his poor son was like quite, you know, kind of caught up in this feeling of like what could have been and um, the, you know, how much money they could have had. But Health was an incredible guy and he left an amazing legacy just by being there so early on and writing a lot of the early code of Bitcoin wallets and things too. So, um, yeah. Sorry, we've gone, we've gone a long way from. Hey, no, Jack it, but it was this, interesting. But, I'm, yeah. You know, I'm sat here kind of like fascinated um, by the story almost. But I think we're probably pushing close to time there. So. Uh, we should look to start wrapping up. You're going to be speaking soon, actually. Are That's you... right. I'll be giving a talk about the book tonight. Um, and you're speaking tomorrow? Tomorrow morning, yeah. yeah. So are you on the party tonight? So it's like yeah, 5 yeah. or 6 p.m. I'm something? like dinner entertainment, I guess. Nice. Like that. So, and yeah. yeah, I'm tomorrow morning. I think I'm the second talk. So that puts me kind of like 11, cool. uh, 11 in the morning. I'll check it out. Uh, kind of time. But yeah, it's been Yeah, it's been fascinating awesome. to talk about I, I've, stuff. I've read many of your you know stories online over the years. Obviously, the cybersecurity world that we overlap a lot. So... Awesome yeah. to meet you in person. And the next time you like come across a crazy thing happening on a Sunday, call me instead of the BBC, <laughs> all right? You got it. Yeah, thanks.